All right. Good morning, everybody. If you don't have your headphones on yet, please go ahead and put them on. <clears throat> Welcome to SEP321. This is Innovating FIPS Crypto Validation in the Cloud. My name is Alan Halakami. I'm a Senior Manager of Solutions Architecture at AWS. I support public sector customers with security, risk, and compliance, and networking topics. So we'll be talking about uh, FIPS 140 today. Uh, an agenda for you to see. We'll go through a little bit of history about FIPS 140 and some context. I'll talk uh, for about half the session about a proposal uh, that AWS has made to the FIPS 140 working group and to industry. Status of that proposal, and then I'll spend the last half of the session um, suggesting some new approaches uh, for validation. I thought I'd start by putting up a quote from Nest, and I'll give you a little bit of time to read it. The notion that the current FIPS 140 process no longer addresses the needs of its user base is acknowledged. This is from Nest's website. So let's talk a little bit about what FIPS 140 is and the history behind it. So FIPS 140 outlines requirements for cryptographic modules, and that seems like a sensible thing to do since cryptography is super important for the way that we provide confidentiality and integrity. And FIPS 140 defines four increasing qualitative levels of security. For the purposes of the talk here today, I'm only going to talk about level one, which is effectively software-only assurance. So if we take a look at the history, FIPS 140-1 issued in January of uh, 1994. About a year later, the cryptographic algorithm validation program and the cryptographic module validation program were launched in support of that standard. Fast forward a couple more years, FIPS 140-2 was issued in May of 2001. There is a FIPS 140-3 that's been signed uh, by the Secretary of Commerce, which I won't talk about. Um, there's another year and change uh, for implementation on that. So let's place this in time. So putting FIPS 140-3 aside for a moment, 140-2 was issued in May 2001. It was subsequently revised um, and republished December of 2002. If we look at this just in terms of what happened after it, what we think of today as monthly patching as kind of a standard practice wasn't really formalized until about 2003. What we think of today as modern web mail became a thing around 2004. And social media, in the way that we see it today, started around 2003 and really became um, kind of a public use uh, capability in 2006. Amazon's own simple store service launched in March of 20, uh, March 14th of 2006. So why am I saying all these dates? Well, the standard came into effect at a time when software changes were slowly moving, right? However, the rate of change and fundamentally the basic IT model was about to change dramatically. Okay, so what does any of this have to do with cloud and why are we having a session on validation on the cloud? What's the problem? Well, for one, the standard specifically calls out that an operational environment at level one is single operator, and the cloud is typically multi-operator, right? You have a cloud service provider and you have a customer. Putting a really fine point on it, here's text from the implementation guide for the module validation program. A third-party cloud system that provides its own operating environment, such as an operating system and hardware upon which the tester has no control, possible examples are Amazon Web Services, shall not be used. So we have this challenge about the operational environment. The second is what we call specific configuration. For example, the AWS Key Management Service Hardware Security Module is FIPS 140-2 validated overall level two on hardware version 2.0 with firmware 1.4.4 and a specific non-modifiable operating environment. So those of you paying close attention, 
are going to ask how it is that the AWS KMS HSMs are FIPS 140-2 validated. So based on my prior comments, that shouldn't be possible, right? Well, in this case, Amazon is the sole operator of the environment. We provide a fully managed service to our customers, and so it's effectively single operator. And while we make customers, uh, while we make it available to customers to you, Amazon is the sole operator of these HSMs. Moreover, it's possible for us to take an HSM out of a rack and send it to a lab. If you think about Amazon Elastic Compute Service, uh, Amazon's Elastic Compute Cloud EC2, it's more than a sheet metal box, right? We have a control plane that does provisioning. Uh, we have a data plane where customer data flows. We have systems that are pushing code and doing health checks, and we have security automation that's validating the information security posture of the environment. So it's much harder to carve out EC2 and send that to a lab. I also mentioned that we have these processes that push code. So in these cloud environments that operate on a continuous availability model, that is, we don't have planned downtime, the systems are constantly in a state of change. So whether those changes are security related, and Amazon will always act to protect its customers, or whether those changes are related to services or features, the environment doesn't have a static state which is easily and readily definable in a validation certificate. So the validations that are done for many other level one software components have clearly defined configurations. This specific configuration problem is why people say, well, with FIPS 140, I can either be validated and compliant or I can be secure. A final point, as currently implemented by industry, FIPS 140 validated modules are less performant than non-validated modules. Why is this? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Some of them have to do with the algorithms themselves. Some of it has to do with the validation requirements that FIPS 140 requires, such as uh, internal self-tests and some of these peepholes that are put in peepholes that are put into the code for the validation process to see kind of the internal workings uh, when the uh, when the algorithms are in the labs. So it makes it hard to make statements like everything in the environment will run a FIPS 140 validated algorithm, because in fact that translates to cost. So take for example Amazon Simple Storage Service, Amazon S3. In a single region, Amazon S3 will manage peaks of 60 terabits per second of traffic in a single day. If the crypto modules used are even 1% less efficient, that's a significant impact to customers that's addressable only by adding more hardware and thus cost. Now, of course, AWS does provide FIPS 140 endpoints, and we have many customers that opt in to use them. So, how does a module get validated anyways? Well, there are four effective steps here. In the first step, the cryptographic algorithm validation program validates the implementation of a FIPS 140 approved and NIST recommended cryptographic algorithm and its related components. Algorithms are tested by cryptographic and security testing labs, CST labs, and they're accredited under the National Voluntary Laboratory Accreditation Program called NVLAP. So I'll use an analogy to explain how these things work together. Uh, for those that are familiar with the Federal Risk and Authorization Management Program called FedRAMP, we have this notion of third-party assessment organizations or 3PAOs. So the analogy is that a 3PAO is to A2LA, the organization that accredits the 3PAOs, as the CST labs are to NVLAP, who accredits the laboratories. So once the algorithm certificate is issued, you can proceed to the module validation process. CAVP is a requirement prior to CMVP. Under CMVP, the labs test modules using derived test requirements, implementation guidance, and other programmatic guidance from NIST. So here's a picture of the cryptographic modules validation process, and you'll note how agile it is, or not. This can take months or years to complete. 
Once the module is validated, a certificate is issued, and the last step is the actual implementation of the model in a conformant configuration. Now, are you operating in a valid state? Does that mean that it's a secure state? Let's leave those questions to the second half of the presentation. For now, the question that I want to answer is, how can we speed up this process and remove this false choice between compliant or secure? It turns out the reviewing lots and lots of documentation doesn't make a thing more or less secure. What if we fundamentally change the model? What if vendors or developers could integrate into their CI-CD pipelines test harnesses for validation? What if we could automate this? And what if that automation would yield a validation certificate? Enter the Automated Cryptographic Validation Testing Program, or ACVT. ACVT is an initiative by NIST to move to automation of the FIPS 140 validation process. If memory serves, this started around 2016, and the program defined three working groups, the algorithms working group, the modules working group, and the cloud working group. These groups work together to share best practices, coordinate handoffs, and negotiate integration elements between them. Ultimately, the goal of this working group, or these working groups, is to have a rationalized, coherent life cycle that maximizes reuse and minimizes low-value work. Because of the inherent relationship between these working groups, cloud uses modules, modules use algorithms, and so on, we need to start with the algorithm validation so that we have the foundation to build and work up to the cloud modules. And the working group has made great strides with automation. So for the cryptographic algorithm validation program, the working group is nearly complete with that automation process. With uh, ACVP, an algorithm provider can become either a first party lab, which was not previously possible, or they can use an existing accredited lab. In either case, whether first party or using a, an accredited lab, the accreditation is done through NVLAP. And in either case, a test harness and protocol is used. You can see from the ACV page, ACVP webpage, that the assets are available on GitHub. Transition to this new automated approach is underway with all new algorithms expected to use this new process by mid-2020. With algorithm testing largely buttoned up, we now move to the work of module validation. And we have pilots in process with an intention to move in 2020, mid-2020, to additional pilot testing. When we get into the module testing, that's where the cloud comes in. We set out in partnership with NIST and the ACVT program to create a framework that would support the assurance goals of the FIPS 140 standard, but we wanted to go in with a set of tenants that established what we were trying to accomplish and anchored our evaluation of the possible solutions. First, we wanted a framework that did not require a choice between a validated operation and a secure operation. Any proposal had to support a mechanism for continuous validation. That is, an operating environment changes and the framework should allow, in real time, the advancement from a validated configuration to a validated configuration. In fact, we wanted the framework to compel validation and to compel forward motion with respect to patches. Number two, we wanted the framework to acknowledge that in the cloud, the typical operating model is multi-party. The responsibility for maintaining a validated module is shared. Said differently, the validation is composable. Third, although the validation is multi-party, we wanted to minimize the coordination by the parties. If the cloud provider, for example, makes a change, that shouldn't require notification to every module provider and in turn for each of those module providers to revalidate their modules. Four, we wanted a framework that could apply consistently to, in this terminology, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, bare metal, and any subsequent future operating models that the industry could come up with. 
in five, we wanted a framework that could borrow from and leverage existing investments made by the cloud service providers in secure operation. There are management, operational, and technical controls that are almost uniformly reviewed by third-party auditors for these cloud service providers. And on the backside of that, we receive authorizations and attestations and accreditations. So before I explain the proposal, let me explain some of the key elements and the terms that I'll use. The Assured Platform is a third-party operational environment. This concept is key to the framework. It is the fundamental abstraction that allows us to support multiple operational models in a consistent way. Effectively, this is the provider portion of that composable validation. The Software Cryptographic Module is the specific crypto service component that will be FIPS 140 validated. The operating environment is the overall technology stack that's the, that supports the operation of the software cryptographic module. The consumer here is the service or application or user that's utilizing cryptographic functions of the software cryptographic module. And finally, on the left, the test harness. The test harness is a, is a NIST-sponsored open source project that includes a test framework and a microkernel or similar minimalistic design to execute test routines on an assured platform. So rather than providing you chapter and verse on the proposal itself, let's cut straight to answering the question. What is required to deliver a validated module on a cloud service provider? The proposal identifies a three-step process for delivering a validated module on the cloud. The first step is for the third-party provider to accredit their platform as an assured platform. An assured platform is one that demonstrates through a NIST-approved assurance framework that the system, which itself could be composed of multiple components, is managed in a secure way. One example of a NIST-approved assurance framework could be FedRAMP, which today is used by the U.S. federal government to authorize multi-tenant cloud services. Step two. Step two involves the initial and then ongoing periodic demonstration that changes in the assured platform do not adversely impact critical operations relied upon by software cryptographic modules. A simple example would be patches to the virtual machine monitor of a hypervisor. This step would utilize an open source FIPS 140 validation test harness provided by or sponsored by NIST. To avoid complexity introduced using a full OS, we've proposed the use of a microkernel that is specifically built to this purpose. That's not to suggest that an OS couldn't be used, but we prefer something that's fit to function. The idea here is that the test harness would integrate into a standard CI-CD pipeline, making it part of ongoing software validation done by the Assured Platform provider. The test results are stored by the Assured Platform provider, subject to audit, and periodically released to NIST in a machine-readable format. The receipt by NIST of these outputs generates and maintains an Assured Platform certificate with an identifier used downstream by the software cryptographic modules. I should note here that the uh, Assured Platform itself is composable. So for example, Imagine a platform as a service offering that is built on an infrastructure as a service offering. In this case, the platform as a service could become an assured platform that is built on that infrastructure as a service platform. These parties could maintain independent statuses without the requirement to directly coordinate, but still deliver a composable validation to a software cryptographic module. In the final step, the overall operating environment for the software cryptographic module is validated, not just the assured platform, to ensure that the derived test requirements and implementation guidance for the cryptographic modules validation program are met for FIPS 140 level one. The validation is achieved using the automated validation process under development by NIST in the automated cryptographic validation testing program. And in this step, the software cryptographic module provider 
uses a software test harness that can, be ex that can execute test vectors and is based on the derived test requirements. The Assured Platform Certificate Number, provided in the prior step, is included as part of the submission and is ultimately incorporated into the Module Validation Certificate. Because the, this Cloud Assurance Framework is composable, this step can happen at any point. And an, off, an Assured Platform Certificate is available for the operating environment. So let me say that again. This can happen at any point. The Assured Platform can generate a certificate that's available. The software cryptographic modules provider, providers rather can come at any point and do their module testing. Also, as it is today, if step three is completed by someone else, that validation is reusable. So the framework provides the following three key outcomes. One, composable validation. The Assured Platform and the Software Cryptographic Module operate with minimal coordination, but deliver a validated configuration. The Assured Platform can be singular or built on top of other Assured Platforms, and the Software Cryptographic Module is built on one or more of the Assured Platforms. Two, continuous validation. The Assured Platform and the Software Cryptographic Module are both able to run ongoing periodic testing as needed to maintain the overall validation of the software cryptographic module. Each party has separate and definable responsibilities in supporting the overall validation of the module. Three, existing investments in assurance frameworks like FedRAMP or ISO 27001, et cetera, are leverageable by the assured platform providers. So a quick snapshot of current status. The AWS provided proposal is generally supported by NIST and industry with some tweaks here and there that we're working through now. After a joint meeting at the International Cryptographic Modules Conference in Vancouver last month, the Cloud Working Group is agreed to move forward to the next level of detail, including defining the concept of operations. So, I spent the first half telling you about where we're going in terms of automating validation and how we're proceeding to provide validation capabilities on top of cloud service providers. But I wanted to take the last half of the presentation to talk to you about the work AWS is doing and that we're proposing to NIST as we look to the future of validation. At the beginning, I raised three core challenges for FIPS 140 validation. Operational environment, specific configuration, and performance. The Cloud Assurance Framework that I just discussed addresses the operational environment, and it allows us to answer the mail on the specific configuration portion of the module by issuing these certificates against assured platforms. However, this performance component remains. Imagine not having self-tests in the crypto module. Imagine not having to put these little peepholes into the module or the algorithm for examination during validation. What if we could just know a priori that a module would operate properly? Enter automated reasoning. AWS is making big investments in automated reasoning and formal methods for validation. You've heard us talk about Zelkova, and you've seen Zelkova at work in the S3 public bucket notification on the AWS console. And perhaps you've played with the network assessments component of Amazon Inspector. All of these are built on automated reasoning. We believe this work has the potential to reduce the performance penalties or eliminate the performance penalties associated with operating a FIPS 140 validated module. So people have reasoned about the infinite using finite reasoning since the beginning of recorded history. In mathematical logic, this work is separate into two, separated into two distinct activities. The first is the search for a proof. This is a creative endeavor where smart people find ways to express a theory in logic. Euclid, for example, reasoned that there were an infinite number of prime numbers, and he certainly didn't count them all. The second activity is the process of checking the proof. Euclid captured his proof in a way that someone else could replay the steps to convince him or herself of its correctness. 
the process of checking Euclid's proof was done by humans. So the first activity tends to be harder, although more interesting, and the second activity tends to be easier, if not boring. Since around the 1970s, we've moved from humans creating the proofs and checking the proofs to humans creating the proofs and machines checking them. The four color theorem is one such example and apparently really useful if you're into stained glass or maps. The theorem states that no more than four colors are required to color the regions of a map such that no two adjacent regions have the same color. This was proven correct by machines in the 1970s. Interestingly, the people proving things about mathematical artifacts became interested in proving things about industrial artifacts. And it turns out that these areas are very similar. In math, we think about, we think about vertices and edges. In industrial systems, we think about state machines and transition diagrams. The same techniques that you use on these mathematical artifacts can be used on these industrial artifacts. So if you fast forward to early 2000s, where algorithmic advances made it possible for machines both to find the argument and check it, making the impossible possible. Let me give you an example. So I want to give you an illustration that will highlight a very concrete example that I'll give you downstream. But here are two related truths about security. One, defenders have to prevent all problems. Two, attackers need to find one entry point. Formal verification methods aim to enable number one on core critical components. And this works on small code bases, and it's useful in practice because, first off, many systems tend to keep the security critical components small, whether that's in the hypervisor or the OS kernel or secure channels. And two, technology advances have decreased the overall level of effort required to gain confidence using these formal methods. So I have a grid of bugs on the screen. This grid represents a program. White represents correct behaviors. Orange represents incorrect behaviors or unauthorized access. So let's flip the tiles over and play a security game. So the defender goes first and picks 10 squares. Think of this as your penetration testing or AppSec review or your FIPS 140 cryptographic module validation. You turn over the tiles and you find two incorrect behaviors. Okay, we fix them. Turn the tiles back over. Now it's the attacker's turn. Now your code is live. In the attacker's turn, they can pick 10 tiles, but in practice, they'll probably pick 20 or 30 or 40. And when you turn over the tiles, the attacker found a single incorrect behavior. As you can see, this game favors the attacker. Moreover, the attacker has the luxury of time. You've probably heard your favorite cryptographer or crypto expert talk about the potential benefit to bad actors or nation states of capturing data today that they cannot decrypt, but potentially could decrypt in the future. That's why, for example, AWS is actively engaged in the NIST post-quantum cryptography standards process, including two of seven second round candidates submitted by AWS, known as Bike and Psyche. These formal verification methods cover much more of the state by understanding the underlying structure of the code components. If we look carefully for patterns, we can see that all of the bad states in this example are definable in simple formulas. Formal methods allow us to use formulas like this to describe the base states as well as the behaviors of the program. If we can show that the program always reaches states that are not one of the known bad states, then we will know the program never enters a bad state. And these formulas can succinctly represent large numbers of states. So as the state space of the program grows, 
we can continue to capture the safe behavior in a small, efficient way. So these formal verification methods spend a lot of effort understanding the structure and in many cases using domain-specific languages to define that structure. In the limit, you can prov provide, I'm sorry, in the limit, you can prove that the code is correct in all cases. And when we think about cryptographic module validation, this is the key. Let me give you a very concrete example. I'm gonna talk about Amazon's S2N TLS library. I'm sure all, you're all familiar with Heartbleed. I'm sure you're all familiar with other vulnerabilities that have been discovered in the OpenSSL library. Amazon S2N is a TLS implementation that was inspired by vulnerabilities discovered by researchers in other crypto implementations. It's written with security and performance in mind, and it's a much smaller code base. So if you look at uh, OpenSSL all up, it's 500 to 600,000 lines. The TLS component's about 70,000 lines. S2N in total is about 6,000 lines of code. And we use these formal methods to validate S2N. So uh, S2N is uh, available on GitHub. It's, um, you can you know, submit pull requests and so on. As the code base changes and we go through the build pipeline, we have a proof test in line the, with the build. A proof failure is a build failure. And we use capabilities like the Software Analysis Workbench, or SAW, for formal modeling and verification. We use a domain-specific language for crypto called Cryptol. If these types of things are interesting to you, uh, I recommend checking out AWS SideTrail on GitHub, which can help you do some of these things as well. So if I give you an example of what this means in practice, here's a, a demo run of a build. You can see in the bottom left hand uh, some of the components of the library that are being tested. But take a look at the top. We've run 12 builds on a branch of demo that verifies 1629 properties. To gain the equivalent assurance through test cases, we would need to run 2 times 10, 2.4 times 10 to the 130 tests. Formal methods take complex space and make it understandable and validatable in a short amount of time. This particular run completed in seconds, not hours, and certainly not years. If you're interested in learning more about continuous formal verification with Amazon S2N, there is a uh, white paper, actually a published uh, peer-reviewed research paper that's available. You can get to it from our website, aws.amazon.com slash security slash provable hyphen security. You'll also find some other white papers there talking about uh, secure boot processes in our data centers and so forth. Now, this topic tends to have a lot of questions, and so I wanted to leave a good amount of time for questions at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and thank you here and step off to the side to take your questions, but thank you for attending the session. I hope you found this useful.